Hello everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Stoke Sound Podcast. I'm your host, Ed Stokes, and today we have the super talented Lawrence Biercardi from Old Mastering. Lawrence, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? Thank you very much. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, surviving. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really wanted to bring you on to this episode because you are a super talented mastering engineer and I absolutely love what you do. And I thought that the audience would absolutely love to hear kind of your process um, and how you go about mastering and your approach and the kind of things uh, you use. So, um, yeah, if you want to give us a little introduction, talk a little bit about yourself and then uh, we can go into it. Sure. So, hi, world. Um, yeah, my name's Lawrence Biancardi. So I, I work, I uh, run Alt Mastering, which is a mastering service, uh, predominantly online mastering service. Um, so I work here from my home studio um, and I master records. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've been mastering for quite a few years now. I kind of started in music like a lot of people, probably with a, a dream of being a rock star. <laughs> and then it slowly, <laughs> slowly got crushed. <laughs> Love but yeah, that. No. <laughs> uh, yeah so i think that's how we're engineers become engineers i'm pretty sure but yeah um no so i started in music i started in like a metal band actually like when i was about 12 um and sort of did that till i was about 18 i was a metal vocalist um and got into music that way um and was all about that life i liked all sort of genres when i was through that phase but metal was the one that i kind of found myself doing more found the community of people around me and then um as I sort of progressed, I went to study music production, actually studied with Ed. So Ed and I uh, studied together. and um, We go long back. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we do, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I like learning all those tools and really enjoyed learning more of the geeky side of audio um, and sound design and sort of creating music and making music that way um, and was making records producing songwriting doing the lot really for for a while um and then i somehow ended up getting more into mastering um so i think naturally it just sort of happens you know i remember thinking back at the time well what am i going to do in music you know i'm going to do this bit of that bit of this trying out lots of things and I, i really enjoyed mastering i really just enjoyed the process of taking a record making it sound better improving it it's very focused um and you can work on a lot of different records, uh, with a lot of variety, um, which is cool. Um, so I got really into that. And then that sort of somehow took over my life, all my thoughts every day, just about, oh, I wonder if the, the compressor will sound better in front of the EQ and the EQ sound better in front of the compressor. And there's like endless research. And yeah, it just took over my life, really, to the point where <laughs> love I'm that doing that. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I found myself doing more and more and got known for and built a sort of reputation. And so I was like, I'm just going to focus on this. It's what I enjoy. It's what I do. It's what people like me for. It's what I like, you know. It's amazing. I feel like, especially in like the mastering industry, like you've got to be absolutely obsessive with <laughs> yeah. making records sound yeah. good because as we both know, there are so many multiple ways of getting something to the, to the end product. Yeah. So yeah, you've got yeah. to really find out your way of doing it and understand the knowledge of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's kind of what I wanted to get you on to the podcast because, you know, let's go back to basics. Can you explain what actually is mastering right so audio mastering is essentially the last step the last creative step in finishing a song so traditionally a mastering engineer was a bit of a less creative job where maybe they were taking the records and putting it to vinyl essentially like a cutting engineer um, and over the years it's become more of a creative role and the standards perhaps have changed quite a lot. The way people approach it have changed quite a lot. And there's still some tradition in there. But essentially, I'm here to help people finish their songs at the end of the day. I can process it to make it sound how I think it should sound. It should be maybe like this. Just take over the finish line really creatively as much as I can to make it vibe and say it's done, call the record done, make you stop having to tweak stuff we call it a day, I'll make it sound better, I'll give it back to you, you can upload it to streaming services, put out to vinyl, have it to film, and just sort of have that peace of mind really that your record's finished and it sounds good and it's going to compete. Amazing. I feel like once you sense the mastering, it's like the job's done. It's like yeah. the end goal now, it's finished finally, because 
I feel like with anything creative, it's always like, well, how long is a piece of string? It's never really truly finished. But mentally, when you send it to a mastering engineer, it's done. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that's great. So are you in the box or are you out the box for your mastering? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Like, so I, I use some analog gear um, to help achieve a certain sound that I like. Um, and I've acquired good pieces over time. And I do also use digital processing for the stuff that I feel like digital is better at than analog, really. Um, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, you know, Lawrence, can you chat about then your process? So let's say I'm an artist. I've gone to a mixing engineer. I've had the track mixed. And now I'm going to send it to you. What's your process within your business um, you know, start from stage one and go all the way through to the final stages. Okay, well, how long have you got? Uh, so, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I'll try not Three to do it in real time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, I think it's important to find out, like, have a conversation with an artist. Like from experience, if you if you have a conversation with an artist and ask them what their current thoughts are on the record and what they like about it, what they want to see improve. I think that gives you a good indication of areas to potentially look out for or listen out for when you're working on a record. So everyone's an individual and everyone has their own idea of what they think their record sounds like and what they want their record to sound like. And if as it's it is a service industry, although it's creative and people are essentially paying for your opinion at the end of the day because you are part of the process, that you also are trying to help them enjoy their song more and make it more pleasurable for them to listen to. So I think finding out details from them is important. Um, so you can have a bridge of helping them, but also like doing what you think is good too, that they may not know it could be. So it's the balance between that. Um, so uh, if I, if I have a conversation, I might ask what, what is it for? Is it for is it streaming? Is it for film? Do you want it to be the same file length? Um, do you, what do you want out of the mastering process essentially and sometimes people know sometimes they don't know um and that's fine so if if someone doesn't really know they just want what you think would make it sound better that's perfect if if they have an opinion on it that's great too and i can accomplish that and it it helps me deliver back something that's going to be more what they want too um so uh if someone says oh, i really want the low end to come out here and here's a list of notes of things I want to happen in the mastering process. That's great for me because, you know, it's, it makes m my life a lot easier at helping that person achieve the sound they're looking for and making a record sound finished. Um, so I'll take that on board and then think about what I could do to the record to help achieve that goal. Um, the, the most important thing for me is actually just listening to it uh, through without doing anything for quite a few times and making like a mental picture of what I think the record could benefit from to sound more vibey, to sound finished, to sound complete. Um, so I, th I kind of scan through like frequencies and like general feeling of the song, how it hits me emotionally, the dynamics of the song, what it has on it already, what it could benefit from and kind of make a mental note of that. Um, I remember previously when I first started masking for people, and knew just about enough information to make problems on people's songs. Do you know what I mean? The start <laughs> of the days. <laughs> and um, it was very much, uh, I've got a record, I'm going to tweak this, do this, do that, and push through this. And just, it was a bit of an experiment at the very start when I first started with people's records, because I don't think I knew what records needed or what, I wasn't really listening that much, actually. I know it's bad to say, but it's very easy to tweak. Um, and not be listening. So detaching from that and having that step where you listen, I think is super important. Listen to the client, listen to the song and make a note of what it needs. And it saves you so much time. You can get results that are going to work every time because you know you're going with a goal in mind of what it needs. Because In the mastering, you, I'm sure everyone knows this and you know this, that you can make a record sound worse. It doesn't, you, Happens doesn't a lot. mean you can make it better, right? <laughs> <laughs> like knowing what not to do is almost more important than knowing what to do, I think, when it comes to mastering in, in many ways. That's um, what I always say to people. It's like, you know, when they go, well, how long does mastering take? And you're like, oh, you know, it costs X amount and it's, you know, only takes 30 minutes. You know, that's so expensive and whatnot. And it's like, well, no, you're, you're paying 
for them to not do any, to, to know when not to do anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is literally, you know, as a, as a customer to a mastering engineer, that's kind of what you're paying. You kind of just touched upon that when you said that. It's like knowing not what to do is the value that you're adding to the track. <laughs> it's kind of reverse. 100%, man. Like, yeah. I remember, um, so one thing I like to do quite often is when I've finished mastering a record, so say I, I diagnose the record, and I say, ah, oh, I could probably benefit from this, it needs to be louder, it needs to be more energetic, it needs to be uh, kind of more distorted and energized, or it needs to be EQ'd in a certain way. I would do that, and when I finished mastering the record, I might even come back the next day just for my own self and listen to it again once it's completely done, it's out, you know, it's been approved and just seeing, can I outdo what I've previously done? And I enjoyed doing this process. I'm like, can I do it even better than before? Can I, and it's part of my OCD. Like, I think I'm quite OCD to be fair. And you got to be though, you? <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, it's, yeah, you just spend hours doing it. I'm like, I want to be better and better and better and better and see if I can do that. And um, part of that process is interesting because uh, years ago, I, I learned that I t- I t- sometimes I take like a record I worked on four years ago and go, I'm going to do it without listening to the original and see now if I do that record, will it come out better? And I bloody hope it does. Because if I do a record that I've mastered four years ago and then do it now, if it doesn't come out better, I think I'll just quit at that point. You know, it'd be the most disheartening <laughs> thing. So it's scary to do it. <laughs> but um, often, you know, you're going to go, oh, it was better. And maybe at the time with less knowledge and experience I was doing too much potentially or doing too little potentially um so I think it's it's good practice Same anyway balance to, isn't it yeah and, and and you know understanding the process of of what you're doing so you know if I send a track to you are you mastering within logic are yeah you, I use logic yeah so yeah is that the you, where you're, you're starting so if you talk to me about so if I send you a unlimited track for you to master what's like your kind of go-to routing like setup then okay um so if it's like a single um i'll have logic open i usually have two channels one is the unmastered one with a limiter on it and i call this the faux master of the client basically if they sometimes people give you a faux master sometimes they don't i sometimes will do a faux master of a record pretending it's what they're doing at home to compare against me when they get the record back. So I'm trying to competing against a version of what I think they may do um, if they don't do it already. Um, So then this is also the cleanest kind of like just limited in a nice way, no processing, no potential to do the wrong thing, basically. Like this is just clean, limited, it's louder. And then after I've listened to it and made the judgment of what it needs, um, I'll have the second channel and then I will start applying what I think it needs in order to sound right. And usually it's straight away, um, often, more often than not, EQ balance, like just broad EQ um, yeah. to kind of get things to sound right, basically. Um, Any particular favorite EQs that you tend to go to? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> pretty much all the time now. I mean, uh, I, I use a mixture of the Manly Massive Passive and the Elysia X filter, yeah, yeah. those are my two, um, and they're they're both good in their own way. Uh, I mostly use Manly just for broad, like just broad tone shaping. So when you say broad, you kind of boosting, let's say one hundred and sixteen k, it's kind of that smiley face kind of EQ that's popular. It um it can be obviously it just, will depend. Yeah, it depends on the record. Yes, it just depends on the record. Like I have some consistent clients that mix in a certain way, and when they the way they mix is. Um, it generally doesn't have a huge amount from like say 1k upwards compared to the 1k downwards. So like a massive passive is good at just sort of sending like a shelf from like 1k and just like turning up the top half of a record. It you know you nice. can just bring up general top, general bottom, general mids with a mid boost. So I so think you're, you're about, doing more yeah. uh, additive EQ more so than subtractive on the first EQ. Yeah, I, to be honest, I pretty much never do subtractive EQ in general, like okay. almost never. Um, there's a <laughs> there's a guy that I, I um, 
that I learned some stuff from once and he, he had something that resonated with me was which he said, I just boost my problems away. And it's kind of, it's <laughs> Love kind of that. my mentality too as well. Um, if there's anything to, uh, to take away from this episode, it's, it's literally that. <laughs> boost your problems away. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of how I think about it too. It's like, I, I think about the song and what it's got, what's really good already. And then what it needs more of. And then I, I bring up the difference of what it needs. I don't really right. subtract what... I don't like to think about someone's record and think, th- this has too much of this. This needs to go. This needs to be less. This needs to be less. Because I feel like people already hear the record and they're like, I get the feeling they want more. They want more like they want their track to come back bigger, better, louder, um, more clear, more more energy, you know, um, rather than like take my record and strip away what I've done. So mentally for me, I'm just like, I'm going to bring up what it needs more of, you know, what's already in the record, what can what can be more, basically. Fantastic. <laughs> said more and, like a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> and do you compress on your masters? Because I know some mastering engineers don't really compress much. Uh, they use mm. more limiting than anything. I know it's similar, but do, yeah. do you find your doing any mid-side eq and then compression or i work exclusively in mid-side pretty much um like the whole analog chain in mid-side so um i run like an io plugin in logic out yep. in just in the chain and that's uh mid-side mode so i run through like a dual mono eq the manly um i do a tiny bit of compression sometimes it just depends on the record but i generally find like fast limiters doing a little bit like reducing transient material that's like fairly non-musical helps the most in gaining like loudness but if a song needs some mm, what's the word like glue like to make things feel a bit more smoothed out and together I might just touch a compressor a little bit to help things feel more together but in terms of compression i pretty much exclusively use high ratio like limiting uh very fast but not often on for a very long amount of time just to take away the transient edge to make things a bit louder but yeah um more multi-band compression than full band compression if i had to pick i think okay interesting so uh, are you kind of so you you so if we just go back to kind of square one so you're e- EQing first doing like broad strokes EQ first with a manly and this is is this analog yeah and this is in mid side yeah and then you're and then after that would is that then when you would go to if you were to compress compression or would you then go straight into limiters or stereo widening okay what, yes what's... um it I mean, of, of course, it yeah, will change it every yeah, song, yeah. but I'm just right. talking just in general, just so yeah. the listeners can kind of understand kind of the process. Sure. Um, sure. So I think like getting the record to sound finished with EQ, like balance is the first thing I'll do. I think about, I'm like, okay, I get this to be balanced because um, I've tried the whole compression first, li- uh, EQ first and limiting first, um, EQ first, different orders. And for me, if I get the balance right to where i think it should be then it brings up information that was that might now potentially have dynamic issues that didn't previously when it was eq different so sometimes there are issues that exist that you can't really hear because the balance is off yeah um so i think if i get the balance right then i'm like okay now it sounds balanced maybe there are some dynamic issues within that mix that could are distracting to listen to potentially or could just be tightened up um quite often i have uh, a multiband compressor before i go out to the box if the low end is really intense of a record so like modern pop like with heavy 808s and stuff that stuff often doesn't agree too well with clipping or like distortion processes it just smashes into it and it's quite noticeable yeah and if a record already has any distortion in that's going to be hitting into the analog gear quite hard in a noticeable way. It will sound like it's reacting to it. So quite often I'll have a multiband set up to tighten up those that low end dynamically before it goes out to the analog gear. Before it so, goes out to the EQ. So you do the multiband yeah. first to yeah. control the low end, for example, in a pop 808. Yeah. Then it goes out to the analog EQ so it sounds a bit more 
uh, controlled and balanced before you do the EQ and that you're doing all the mid side. So you're lifting up the sides and the mids and that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just think about like, where is it spatially? Like what could, if it's very focused on the, on the front, it's cool, but maybe I might even just poke around in the sides and the, in, in like a like a shelf and to see what that sounds like does it add something nice to the record does it bring up new detail of stuff that wasn't already there i yeah. might just see what's there you know like um bring that out i'll then go into like uh so that's the tube eq which is kind of like a slightly softer quite visceral like sound and then uh, go into the x filter which is um a, like a solid state eq which is a lot brighter and to me it has a tone that's a bit sharper than like a tube eq so when I EQ with that one, it, it can help things cut through a bit more. Like if I want to give a record, it sounds natural now when it's balanced. If I want to give a record a bit more bite, like it's something to cut through, I might EQ a bit with that to push it through. But with the Manly, if you push with that, it's still quite smooth it, when so you boost it. So are you it. doing this second EQ as mid-side as well? It's weirdly enough, it's a stereo EQ, but it, it's running through it in mid-side. So it will, it will affect the side and mid equally. Right. But it's in mid side, but it's a stereo EQ, if that makes sense. Fine. And you're boosting kind of just certain frequencies. So if you feel like a record needs a bit more brighter 5K, you'll just do a little kind of bell. Exactly. Yeah. Boost that 5K kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then after that, do you, do, I mean, do you do any kind of, um, when I chat to some um, mastering engineers, they like mono everything to 40 hertz, do a high pass up to 20 hertz. Do you do, you do any high, low passes on the overall record and mono anything as well? And then stereo widen at all after that? I used to a lot more. You know, there's a lot of stuff I think in mastering that is is kind of taught what people do. Um, That's and, what I'm interested to have you yeah, on. <laughs> I, I want to get all the it. secrets out of you. <laughs> I followed it for a while, you know, like I was I was doing it quite a lot. And then um, I got to the point where I was like, I'm not going to do anything unless I can hear it needs doing. Or so I, I stopped doing anything by habit for a while. And if there's a point in a record where like I need a little bit extra headroom or I feel like the low end is just a bit muddy, maybe I might just reduce it a little bit. But I tend to not do anything out of it's what you should do. I always just do apply what I think it sounds like it needs and, and forget the rest, basically. That's very valuable that you're saying that because I think for anybody listening, that's exactly what you've got to do. There's a lot of videos on YouTube on how to master your song in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, you're an individual and you've got to feel it. It's totally. all about the feel and vibe and, you know, and break rules and screw up. Exactly, yeah. And win some occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but totally. you know uh, i mean so uh, if you feel like then the record doesn't need anything i mean so is that when you then go to your limiter and if so you're using multiple limiters to get your loudness yeah so like um out the box i use i have a couple of like limiting sort of limp things so um one is the rupert neve signs mbp which is dual mono compressor limiter saturator EQ, and the limiter on that's really nice, um, just for catching peaks. Um, and again, it's probably not as fast as a digital brick wall limiter because I don't think it can be because it doesn't really have like a look ahead feature. Um, but it sounds good, and I, I try to catch a few peaks on that so then I can go into the box. And I try possibly not to use as much plugins in general. Like if I can use analog, I will have the better maker mastering limiter darth limiter and that's good as like clipping or limiting and clipping and limiting are essentially the same thing but li limiting you know, clipping is just extremely fast attacks so at the point where it clips essentially it's like brick wall limiting but yeah it just cuts off all the transients yeah. doesn't it, over the threshold <laughs> some records sounds good like if the record can tolerate the sound if it's potentially very distorted or needs more energy and it's lacking it like the chemistry of like giving something more distortion can work well to something that doesn't have much distortion and feels like it could benefit from it. It like marriages well, but not every record needs that. Obviously it just depends on the, the chemistry of what, how things interact, I think. Um, but then pro L2 in, in always pro L2. So you're, using, <laughs> you're potentially using two analog limiters potentially, and then yeah. pro L2. Yeah, and you're yeah, doing yeah. small amounts. So, I mean, are you doing like two dB gain reduction on each limiter, or are you doing like five? Again, I know yeah. this is going to depend on the record, but just in general terms, you mm -hmm. know, are we talking very light limiting on the analog, 
or are we talking kind of a little bit more than that? Um, it, for me, it's um, usually about how long, how often the limiting lasts rather than, than like how much. So for some records, one thing that's really good about the Pro L2 is that it's got um, at the bottom right hand side of it, it has that like little headphone button where you can listen to what's being reduced, like the delta of it. Yeah. And it's pretty interesting because like when you have a very fast release time on it, it it sounds non-musical. It's like <laughs> crackling sounds. And it, that's cool because it means that really if that's happening, you're not getting as much musical information pumping, basically. So yeah. the less of the song you can hear, less notes, less musicality, that's kind of a good place to be, but at the cost of more distortion. So there's a fine act between like limiting down the stuff that's non-musical, that's not going to affect how the record feels and moves on some records. Um, And that could be 2 dB, 3 dB on one limiter, it could be 1 dB, but it just depends on how loud the record is already and how much transient information it has already. Um, so it's just but, a push and pull yeah. method. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like sharing the weight though is better because I think if they're basically working in in series um, instantly at the same time, it's giving each limiter a bit more of an easy job basically because instead of having to react like 6 dB, 2 dB, dB 1 dB, 7 dB, you can just sort of, one limiter is just doing 2 dB, 2 dB, 2 dB, 2 dB quite consistently. The other one's doing 1 dB, but they're working at the same time. So essentially, it's less work for each one, but working like exact same time. So it just works faster. That's my better. kind of way of doing it as well. Having multiple yeah. things, doing small things kind of makes sounds better quality to me. But it's interesting when you talk sure. about the Pro L2, because um, whenever I'm trying to get things loud, I always leave the Pro L2 default just change the modern to transparent and the attack release just leave it kind of where it is mm. and i put my ceiling at 0.1 and just slam it <laughs> <does the job. laughs> it's good man it's great it's a great limiter it really is it like, just this... works it does work yeah I, I, actually that kind of goes on talking about ceiling i know it's a little bit technical but mm. you know you see some mastering engineers and they're like no because you know this distortion like you need to have it on 0.5 and then you see some people on 0.3 and some people on 0.1 and then some people on minus one minus two what would you say again it potentially could change from track to track mm. but what is kind of right, if that makes sense? I mean, I, mm. I know there's no right or wrong, but is there any kind of what? What is your view on that? Because I personally always leave it on zero point one. It means it can't distort clip. So mm. for me, I'm happy. But I do speak to other people, and they're like, no, because it can still create distortion. So yeah, what's yeah. your take on that? Well, the thing is, like, people really okay. Let's go back a bit. <laughs> so I'll explain this. So if you've got a file that's 24 bit 44.1 with 0.1 headroom, like that's what's left of it, ceiling. At a 24 bit file, you're not going to get your distortion if it's playing back on most systems um, with the true peak limiter on that's preventing overs from going over it. As soon as that file is converted down to an MP3, it's now got overs. It's now got true peaks above zero. And that's where the problem is of when it gets converted down. But 0.1 isn't enough, 0.3 isn't enough, 1 is barely enough, probably like 2 or 3 actual dB is really enough to prevent overs at an MP3. So, but no one's going to, you're not going to give back a, you know, 3 dB of headroom file to song because it's going to sound relatively quiet compared to anything they can, they're listening to it against. So in, in, in terms of the best interest of a client, um, I think 0.3 and 0.1 or 1 are relatively similar in terms of how it's gonna, how much intersound peaks are gonna be caused when it gets converted down to an MP3. Yep. People sort of expect a, a file to come back at a certain thing. So point one is is pretty standard. Like a lot of top mastering houses that I've downloaded files from from other artists, people I've worked with, a lot of people do point one. I do point three because someone said at one point do point three. I was doing one because someone told me to do one. And I was like, well, actually, they're all kind of equally as bad as each other and don't matter that much because <laughs> at the end of the day, like people just want the song to sound loud. So I think it, if everyone's doing that and there's input sample peaks on everything and people are streaming at like, what, 96 
kilobytes per second, something super low on Spotify, like low quality when the internet server's bad. We're all hearing in some peaks on every record, most likely. And there's not much we can do about it. And that is the standard. So like, I'm going to give back what people expect to hear. Um, if I was trying to avoid that for reasons stated, like in some peaks, maybe I'll give back 3 dB of headroom, but I'm not going to do that because that will people will just be instantly like, it's a bit quiet. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's the thing, isn't it? It's trying to get the balance of being a, creating a good mastering sound, but also making the client happy and the artists totally. and managers and whoever it is happy. And unfortunately, there is something called the loudness war. Yeah. And it ha- you have to compete. And that's that. But it's, it's interesting, actually, because... It, the, the topic of the whole ceiling thing, you know, it, it, again, it's very technical and very boring. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it is important because, you know, you, you will see a lot of people do 0.1, 1, 2. And, you know, and there, is, there isn't a right answer. But I, for me, I always just say, if, if you do 0.1, you, you're going to be safe. It's, it isn't going to clip necessarily. But, you know, you're going to be okay. So uh, for anybody listening, wondering, you know, what should I be doing? Start with 0.1 and work your way down if you feel like you need to. But like you said, Lawrence, you can't really hear a difference anyway, can you? Between you, you can't hear a difference. <laughs> and pretty much every record is going to have some sort of ensemble peaks once it's converted down to an MP3 and it's on Spotify at low resolution. And people hear that all the time and people are listening in low quality all the time. If the low quality isn't bothering you, which is more actually noticeable than ensemble peaks, then I don't think it's worth worrying about ensemble peaks if you're happy to listen to like absolute bastardized version of an mp3 at the lowest possible quality and you're still enjoying it then you're probably not going to worry about ensemble peaks on a record that you like to be honest yeah i mean that kind of actually brings me on to then talking about your file delivery when you're mastering i mean uh, some mastering engineers give me 24 bit others give me 16 bit Mm -hmm. and then we can talk about dithering um uh, as well so do you send your masters out 24 bit or do you always go down to 16 um generally I deliver back in what someone gives me. So if someone gives me a 48 or 44.1, I'd deliver back at that and 24-bit file. Um, more often than not, if it's for streaming or for like sync work, I'll just give back what they've given me. Sometimes um, people request to have a 16-bit file because of the digital distribution asks for it still. Like they, they ask for 16-bit only. And then I'll just I'll make a 16-bit file version and send that back to upon request but as a rule of thumb i just give back what someone's giving me and i ask them kind of is it going for streaming usually yes uh, is it going for um sync okay i'll you know there's little little tiny things but generally unless someone requests a 16-bit file i give back the file format and the same sample they gave me and if you have to convert down to 16-bit from 24-bit i assume you're dithering and if so, are you That's using right. uh, Isotope to dither or are you using Logic? What, what are you using to dither down? I, yeah, I use Logic's one. You know, you know when you go to export in Logic and it comes yeah. up with uh, Logic this is has the 16-bit one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do rate Logic. I do, I do, you know. Yeah. It has it literally everything. Um, it's It's got everything on it, really. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean... It, Talking a little bit about the sample rate, I mean, I don't want to go in too much detail, but 40, 48, 44.1, are you currently in 2022 receiving more records at 48? Or are you receiving more records at 44.1? I personally, as a mixer, I can't hear a difference. I know people are going to be like, oh, you can't say that, but I'm sorry. I, I, I work at 44.1. I, I can't hear a difference. <laughs> yeah, I can't. It's the, I can hear the difference between 24-bit and 16-bit or like an MP3 and a 16-bit, but between sample rates, like really, I don't know. People say they can, people are like, I believe. And and to me, it's almost on a conspiracy theory level of like weirdness to me sometimes where people swear by one or the other. And it's kind of like, okay, is it the, the whole, do you also believe in the specific frequency that's better tuning like it's in the same realm of feeling to me because really just having a 40 48 um is just a higher sample rate which means that you can have a maximum high amount of frequencies in your project right your project can have higher amount of frequency so half that would be what um 20 kilohertz that's the highest amount or frequency that can be in a project versus 22.1 and human hearing is still like 20 kilohertz and that's 
again, to 20, is, so you can't exactly. hear the anyway. <laughs> exactly. So we can't even hear the bit anyway. But then you could have the argument for okay, well then. Um, it will cause less aliasing because my door can reproduce frequencies higher than that. So there's less likely going to be aliasing bouncing back in my project when I'm using distortion. Okay, but a little bit, but still 48 is not nearly enough. I mean, even at 192, is still not really enough to get rid of aliasing anyway. So there's potential for a 48 to actually have slightly less aliasing than a 44.1, but barely at all enough that it will make an audible difference to a project. So other than that, I can't really see a possible reason why it would sound better. Um, other than for me, I think it just might be a subconscious, like hippie voodoo magic <laughs> that people believe in. But I don't know. It's not for me. I do you know what I say to people when people ask me that, you know, do you mix in 48 or 44? I just go, well, it depends what day it is and, and what my computer can handle. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. File size. That's probably more important than sound quality there's there's bigger things to worry about than those two i think in in audio yeah yeah so when you talk about kind of mastering for streaming is your mastering for film different um do you approach it differently and again we can go on to actually meters as well like well mm -hmm. actually let's talk about the meters first so uh, for streaming are, are you hitting you know a lot of people are hitting minus eight integrated or long term uh between minus eight minus ten um what what are your kind of meters are you looking at when you're marshing and what do you find that the client tends to want um so it's a really good question um so there's obviously some standards in pop music and like maybe rock music um where you can listen to songs without normalization turned on in spotify and you can hear a variety of small differences in normalization of people's mastering approaches in terms of the integrated laughs and RMS. And um, there are some standards, like some records are loud and pops getting louder and louder all the time. <laughs> so for pop music, I generally go by ear and master to records that they like if they have a reference and I'm trying to get it to the similar enough loudness of what the song can tolerate. Like every song can tolerate a certain amount of loudness before it just gets shit, you know, like gets worse and worse. The more you try and try to like crush this thing dynamically to make it loud or distort it to bring up harmonics yeah. or whatever you're doing. So I get it to the point where it's still high quality and tone and sounds good at the maximum loudness that it sounds good with to sound musically emotional and relatively in the ballpark of another record that is similar of a similar nature. But yeah. I won't take something into as loud as a reference track in at the cost of quality, if that makes sense. Okay. And what so, are you metering in? Are you? I I use Logic Stock Multimeter just as a point of reference occasionally, just to see so where it's in, at. Is that an integrated LUFs you're looking at then? I look at a little bit integrated LUFs, but mostly just RMS. Um, when I oh, when no. I first started le learning mastering, the guy was he grew up with like analog gear, so he was like RMS is like this. But again, for me, it doesn't mean much. It for me, it matters more how it sounds next to another record because. At the end of the day, with like Spotify playlists and everything, um, if you're getting into that playlist, they want records that sound right for that playlist. So if someone, say I work on a punk record, I'll go on like Spotify's punk mix and listen to like 10 records back to back and then listen to this record. I might even buy one on Bandcamp of another artist that's on that playlist and bring that into my door and then see what this, you know, how loud that record is and just kind of match it and just imagine one playing into another. Like how would that sound? Yeah. And I might kind of match that a bit sonically if I need a bit of guidance, but often I just kind of go with vibe and sounds rather than the number, if that makes sense. Interesting. And do you, and so your approach then, so if you're not doing it for a playlist and you're doing it for a film or a trailer, mm -hmm. is your approach to mastering very different? And again, is mm -hmm. your metering different slash volume? Uh, yeah, so um, if I'm doing stuff for, that's going to be used in sync, like there's stuff I'm working on at the moment for a, a series, um, and the composer wants it exactly the same file length. So you can't fade, you can't cut, you can't do anything to it. And there's actually a good thing in Logic where if you click on the file, then click on the loop point at the top, then right click on the loop point, you can do set uh, round location, set the 
loop point to be exactly the same as a file, which is really good. So you don't Fantastic. even split yeah. a tiny bit off or at the end. You're not doing it by I, you're doing it by like um by setting, which is good. Yeah. But then they often want it to be they say to me, you don't need to crush it for loudness because at the end of the day, there's probably going to be a voiceover over it, you know? Yeah. So it's going to be dipping out dynamically. So just do what you think sounds good. And again, I just do it by ear and I might reduce it, some dynamics, but with, especially with film music, composition, orchestral stuff, like dynamics is such an integral part of the, of the emotion and the sound of the song that you, you want to, you don't want to crush something for the sake of loudness. You want to like really listen to it and make sure emotionally the dynamics are getting louder and things are coming out and getting quieter like um yeah. so my approach for orchestral hybrid music and generally more acoustic music is dynamics are quite important to the the emotion so I, i'm quite aware of that and won't i'll just go by sound i don't really go by uh digits but what i do generally results in loudness versus it being about a number if that makes sense interesting yeah yeah no, it's, it's interesting to know, kind of listen to, to different ways of, of working um, in that perspective. You, you're kind of going more by feel more so than what numbers you should hit. And, and that is really what you should be doing because it's music at the end of the day. So when you're then um, mastering um, an, an EP, um, are you doing anything different in your process again as when you're then doing it as a single? Of course, I mean, do, do, in Logic, do you have every single track kind of underneath each other and then you balance yeah. match everything? Is that kind of what you do? Yeah, exactly. So um have track by track on different tracks in the order and I have them actually running on a timeline like one into another just so I can hear how it kind of sounds naturally when one ends and when the next one starts in case it's going to go to vinyl like layer down the line. Um, but for streaming, I, I will go through each track and I find the workflow actually using plugins quite useful. So on my output channel... Uh, the master channel, I will route that through my analog processing and not do anything on that as per se, but that will give it a bit of coloration from the tubes, from the saturation, from the other bits of gear that will unify each track and make them feel kind of um, similar in some sort of tonal quality. But then I'll go through track by track and do a like kind of mock-up uh, EQ setting on like Pro Q3 to see yeah. how they all should sound. Then I'll keep skipping from track to track and uh, adjust EQ relative to the next track and see how they feel against one another. Um, so you do the same kind of EQ for everyone, but you will adjust the EQ for yeah. each track to make it feel more cohesive between each track. Exactly, yeah. So there's that, trying to make each track in its own right sound good, like bring up what it needs to feel complete on a track by track basis, but then I'll have to keep skipping through each track, a uh, bit of this, bit of that, and just seeing how they play when you hear one after another, because I'm trying to imagine it as like an album. And by using plugins, it's quite useful because it gives you much more flexibility, uh, being able to hear how they sound one after another by clicking on them. Um, so I do more that. More so with analog, isn't it? Because you've got to print the analog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. so it's almost like mixing, right? It's like if you mix everything in solo, you didn't, you like, you might make, make it sound amazing, but it might sound terrible against the other thing in the song. It's kind of how they feel, and it's it's similar-ish with with mastering an EP or an album. I think, like, how are you how are you doing it then? If you're if you you know, let's, you've only got one manly, I assume. So, mm -hmm. if you are getting a five track EP, let's say, and you've got to master it, are you going to bother using your manly, or are you just going to do it all in the bot? Because it's going to be yeah. hard to know if you're going to have to do it. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I am, um, I will do a mock-up version on a plugin of a manly <laughs> on that channel and figure out yeah. what the settings should be, and right. then I'll have that That's saved clever, on every yeah. track, and I yeah. know what the tracks are going to be. And then when I go to master it, I'll adjust that per track when I go so to just export copy it, it to what you had on the plugin. Exactly. Yeah, and then any little differences that I need to adjust. With another EQ, I use like FabFilter Pro Q3 on that individual channel or like Plugin Alliance uh, Bax EQ and then just have that on track by track basis or, or like a Pro MB track by yeah, track yeah. basis and do things that are tailor made for each song. But then they all go to the same channel with the same limiter and the gain stage in a similar way to make them all feel relatively loud. So you hit the same limiter at the end, but when I export it, it will yeah. kind of gain stage it in at the same level, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so interesting to, to hear your process because when I'm mixing, I, I have a mix bus and um, 
you know, I've said before to people, you know, I mix into my mix bus. Mm. And a lot of the things you're doing in your mastering process is what I do on my mix bus. Oh, interesting, yeah. And I mix into it. So theoretically, I'm kind of mixing into mastering. Now, I know some people are going to be like, well, mix, mix bus and mastering are two separate things. But I do feel like as the years are going on, they're kind of getting closer and closer together. Now, some people will disagree and some people will agree. And I understand that a, a mastering is a different mindset to mixing. Uh, but it is interesting because a lot of the process you're doing, like talking about mid side, like I have a 10K side boost on my mix bus. Mm, mm. And I mix into it like that. So the kind of, it, it's, it, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, what is your, you know, as a marshalling engineer, what's your view on that? Would you say the mix bus is similar to mastering? You know, if I was to put a limiter on my mix bus and get it to minus eight LUFS, it would probably do fine as mastering. Mm. But would you disagree as a mastering engineer? Um, I think whatever people do, like we all will have the same agreed objective, you know, at the end of the day, like with mixing, we're all just trying to make a record sound good. And it's the same thing, really, um, same objective. So if someone's putting something on there, like to make it sound good in the mixing stage, I'm all for that. Like if that makes it sound complete and you're happy with that sound, then I'll, I'll take any record and see if I can then take it even further and develop that with the tools I have. But I appreciate like what people will do in that stage. Um, and I've even received some songs that are limited um, and maybe some marshalling engineers might just send it back and say, can you take the limiter off? I'm going to do it again because I want to do it my way. But I'm like, well, if they like that, then that's what they like. I'm just going to improve that and then take that a step further. And, you know, just if I yeah. can improve it, I'll improve what they give me. But you can do no, it's, what, it's, what people it's interesting to, to know your, your kind of way. And, you know, I always say to people that, yes, the mixed bus is different to marshalling, even though that I do feel like it is getting closer and closer together, you know, as plugins mm. have got better and all of that. But for me, the most valuable thing that I always like to use a mastering engineer for is honestly just a second pair of ears. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I've been mixing this record for, let's say, a day, or even, you know, if, or if I've produced it, you know, I, like, I, I don't want to listen to this record anymore. And I, I, I'm too used to how loud is the vocal in the mix, mm. not does the kick need more punch on different systems? And I, and I think that that's the main difference for me. And I think that when people say, oh, well, you know, I can just, you know, slap a limiter on it while I pay for a mastering engineer. And and as I say, I know we say this, you're, you're, the value you're paying for is one, the expertise of a mastering engineer, but also more importantly, you're, you're paying for someone with fresh ears and their perspective. And there's two things that I, which is why I don't think mastering will ever stop. It will yeah. never, because you know exactly don't be it, jack man. of all trades just be good at one thing that's kind of my way of doing it <laughs> <laughs> totally for sure like you've you've hit the nail on the head there i think like um you are paying for another opinion you're paying for another set of speakers and quite often you know like mastering engineers are quite particular about their speakers and might have a, a very good set of speakers in a treated room that might reveal more of what the song could be or has issues with so yeah often i, I might have tracks where i gonna go hey is there anything we can do about there's a bit of distortion when the bass hits you know there's a bit of crumpling sound there's a bit of crackling sound going on the track and the the mix engineer can't actually hear it so like i'm like okay well i'll do what you know i'll do what i can to fix this issue but if someone can't hear what an issue they can't solve it right so having a mastering engineer is beneficial to potentially reveal stuff that you can't actually hear or you're not sure about fresh perspective all that is so valuable and that's most of where the, the money's going is having someone listen to it who's detached from it in a good room good set of speakers who doesn't have a, you know an emotional attachment to it right now and is going to be invested in it to make it sound better fantastic well lawrence thank you so much for coming on to the uh podcast we really appreciate your time um I always ask this question, and I want to ask you, um, and you can take your time to think about it, but what three things do you know now that you wish you knew when you first started? Three things that I know now that I wish I knew I started. Okay, um, one would be there are, you can apply what you want to a track as long as it sounds good. You know, most people don't like or care and there's no penalty and there's no uh, reward for doing anything in a track 
the reward or the the benefit of make doing anything is to make it sound good. That's the objective. It always should be. So don't do anything because you heard it sounds good because you're not listening. Don't do anything because someone told you not to do that. Like don't refrain from doing anything because that's not what mastering is. Like at the end of the day, you got to make it sound good. And that's the product is the sound. So just focus on that and compare it maybe to other tracks, but just focus on the sound and that all the answers are in the, in the track really. Um, and the conversation between that, the artist of what they want. Um, so no point two dB because you should only do that. Like if the song needs eight dB boost, do it. <laughs> like Amazing. if it sounds better, why would you go with the option that doesn't sound better? Like, because that's what you do. It's like, who cares? It, it doesn't sound as good. Just go with what sounds good. Um, yeah. so that's number one. Sorry, it's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Two, um, uh, it's a service industry, like your business and everything depends on your ability to speak to people, communicate to people, deliver what they want. Some of the greatest slash less ethical companies, like Amazon, um, may be non-ethical companies and they're not great for that, but they're very good with customer service. They deliver you know, they're going to deliver, no questions asked. Oh, I didn't come in the post. They'll send you a new one. No, not going to, not going to start an argument with you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The less friction you have with people, the better relationship, the better experience they had with you. And more likely, I think they'll come back as customers. Um, so that's another thing. Third thing is, um, uh, your, um, c- connections with people is what, matters the most like we kind of spoke a bit of this before the podcast started but um clients do come out of nowhere sometimes but usually it's through a recommendation um and the better more natural connections you have with people that's where like things like trust are built and in a very competitive market where there's so many people doing the same thing all different prices um you know, price isn't really a valid way of differentiating yourself from someone. So I think trust and connection is worth more. And that's what will make people want to work with you is like, if they trust you and they they believe in you and they like working with you, uh, over like, I don't know, other things really. Um, so relationships and trust is everything I think really. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, how can our audience book you to master? Okay, so um, you can you can find me at my website, which is www.altmastering.com. My email is info at altmastering.com. I'm on Instagram at altmastering. <laughs> so many, just the same handle. Yeah, that's how you do it. So at altmastering uh, or L underscore Biancardi is my personal one. But yeah, altmastering is who I am, what I do. We can Google that. It's all fine. So everybody, Alt Mastering, best (laughs) mastering engineer in the market right now. So uh, go and get your tracks mastered by him. Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on to this episode. We really appreciate your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.